similar idea that dovetails with sustainability in my assessment, and that has been underutilized, is the idea of faith. For the purpose of this brief, the concept of faith has three dimensions, and you can see that on this board. I have been working on this for some time, and there is a long paper that will be coming out that will speak about this. I would suggest that the essence of faith is not about religion per se, but it's the foundational basis of any person's view about what justice is about. <clears throat> and thus here we can say the essence of faith is an unwavering commitment to certain principles, be they spiritual or political. In the case of Somalia, where the vast majority of the population belong to the Muslim faith, being faithful entails devotion to basic Islamic tenets at the top of the triangle. For people of other denominations, there are parallels. Such a commitment grounds one's sense of justice and fair play, whether you are Catholic or Jewish or Christian or atheist or whatnot. There is a foundational spring well for that. A second dimension on the left-hand side uh, of faith involves unshakable confidence in oneself, and here is where leadership comes, in one's capacity to have a productive life without looting the commons and usurping what rightfully belongs to other people. Finally, on the right-hand side, faith means a commitment to strive for justice in one's community or country and never to waver in the face of injustice. A political system anchored, therefore, on justice and faith produces and reproduces high levels of trust in leadership and the institutions of the community and the country. If I can have the next slide, please. Can somebody just... Yeah. Can you help me Yeah, there you go. A political system anchored on justice and faith produces and reproduces high levels of trust in the leadership and the institutions of the country and, and, and the country. Conversely, spiritual duplicity invariably means the absence of devotion to these fundamental principles that we noted. Consequently, opportunism becomes the guide to all personal and communal engagements. A political system that's rooted in fortuna breeds mistrust and undermines justice without which peace cannot be sustained and going back to the idea of sustainability. Mistrust of leaders and institutions will mean that an accountable system of government is not possible and hence democracy cannot be built on such a foundation. Thus the two bookends, if you like, of the political order are one which embodies justice and faith and the other which lacks those qualities. Figure two, as I said here, is a schematic description of the first type and indicates a faithful, faithfulness driving force. These two qualities foster trust which, le which leaders' engagement and institutional operations reinforce, without which that cannot happen. Consequently, this produces justice and accountability, an accountable government, which feeds the faithful spirit through a feedback loop. In contrast, the next slide, please, Jibril. I th yeah. <coughs> Consequently, yeah, figure three, as you see on both right and left side, demonstrated how a political system rooted in faithlessness, therefore, produces injustice and undermines, which undermines trust and feeds an environment that's bereft of ethics. I would argue, therefore, that this framework can be profitably used to illuminate what went wrong in the Somali regimes since 1960 what, at independence or the various peace processes. Further, the scaffolding can give us an idea whether the most recent dispensation created in Djibouti is either faithful or can be transformed into a faithful order, and that's the key, or can be transformed, and we'll have something to say about that, in order so that the country can be turned around. I will not bore you with the details of Somalia's past political history, but suffice it to say that the turning point in the country's political history came in 1967 when faithless leaders, and I will dare say that, took the helm and sectarian political forces have been going, gaining momentum ever since. 
What I want you to note on this one is the role of the international community in these two diagrams. And we have, a, again, another long paper about the role of the international community in this, where there is no faith and no commitment to basic democratic values, but expediency, whether it's of the Cold War or the war on terror has been the breeding ground of policy towards that country, then they have either reinforced, most of the time, faithlessness in my assessment rather than faithfulness. Political forces have been gaining ground ever since. We have argued elsewhere that the two major forces implicated in Somalia's misfortune or faithlessness were and are sectarian local political entrepreneurs and cold and terror warriors. From the Djibouti dispensation, can we move into a faithful order? How, okay. I have to run quickly. <laughs> how do these ideas apply to the Djibouti dispensation and how might this edifice be transformed into a faithful order because it's not faithful as it stands in my assessment? Let's take a look at the key actors and examine if they are different from the past ones. One, the ARS. Although the ARS Djibouti faction was dominated by members of the Union of Islamic Courts, its leadership and the significant number of the rank and file departed from the original principles of the UIC. I was a friend of the UIC, so they cannot accuse me of betraying them because I need to speak to them the truth, if you like. UIC's anchor principles of Islam and inclusive Somali citizenship were replaced by tribal politics and the lust for power. I remember saying one statement to a colleague of mine. I said, whoever becomes the Minister of Finance will tell us what that regime is going to be. And needless do I say who it was. And that has exactly happened as I have prescribed. <coughs> The USC was certainly not a homogeneous group, as some members were quite sectarian. Nevertheless, it slowly gained an Islamic and a national ethos, as some of my earlier colleagues have spoken about. What the ARS Djibouti faction did was to reverse this by accepting the contents of the World Law Design Charter and some of their practices. Such transformation eroded much of the credibility, despite the people's yearning for peace in Mogadishu and across the country that Jibril spoke about. Number two, who are the other actors? The TFG, which was established established and that the auspices of EGAD was deeply sectarian and world law dominated. Others have spoken about that. It was also beholden to the Ethiopian regime and thus lacked any legitimacy with the local population. It's <coughs> because of the influence of the international community which financed whatever little resources it had and the failure of the Ethiopian occupation to control the country for them and the intensity of the resistance that forced them to negotiate ultimately with the ARS the final group, the international community. And here I said, with all due respect to diplomatic protocol, but somebody has to speak, and speak bluntly. The international community represented by the United Nations was the other party which played a critical role in the negotiations, and we are grateful to them, broadly speaking. Reliable sources in Djibouti have indicated that the UN Office for Somalia had substantial influence of the ARS, and often used that leverage to dictate terms and principles to the leadership of the organization. Among the most critical interventions made by the United Nations and the international community was to con convince the ARS leadership, convinced that is, to accept the World Law uh, Designed Charter and the tribal formula known as 4.5, which in my opinion is the antithesis of democracy and accountability. The ARS's acceptance of the legal architecture of the TFG meant that the Djibouti operation inherited many of the problems of the previous regime such as the, expansive, uh, the expansion of what was already, as Jibril said, too large uh, parliament. That's larger than the United States Congress. Just imagine this. Finally, senior diplomats of the Western countries, of Western countries and the United Nations representatives strove to have their man to be the prime minister or that minister or otherwise. Such constellation of forces almost mimics, in my assessment, the old alliance between the sectarian local entrepreneurs and the cold and terror warriors that have derailed Somali democracy historically. In fact, what makes the new alliance even more, less legitimate in my assessment than the old order is, that, is the fact that the so-called international community is even more powerful inside Somalia and has greater qualitatively more say about Somalia first than they ever did. Finally, and this is where I'll close, what can be done on the ground? What are the structures and the principles that should be altered in order for the people to buy into the new project? 
This could be done through a variety of ways, but here are just brief skeletal suggestions. One, there needs to be established an autonomous technocratic commission to plan, design, and establish the core public service of the country, not by the United Nations, not by the ARS, not by the government of national unity, but an independent one of people who are respected in that country and globally. Two, create an independent electoral commission to plan and conduct elections in the next two years. And I mean in independent. I worked in South Africa when that happened for that country, and I have some experience in that regard that I can speak about if people are interested in. Three, set up a constitutional commission to draft the national charter, not one that's premised. Its core foundations are sectarian in nature, and that cannot deliver democracy. And fourth, limit post-transition cabinet to 15 posts and no more. Finally, establish what I have called a moral authority for the country to rebuild national belonging and civic fabric. Thank you very much. Well, great. I think that, uh, Professor Samantar kept us all awake. It was very provocative as always. So thank